Hello, hello, and welcome to another Read With Me session. I'm yours truly, Isabel Bedell, and I'm here to read with you another amazing chapter on the, the one and only, the book that we're reading right now. It is The Psychology of Money. The Psychology of Money. Now, this particular book is completely different than the books that I've read in the previous uh, months. But it's definitely a book that you must start reading for you to start thinking differently about money. I was very surprised at how it has really um, impacted me in a positive way because it has helped me see some patterns that you know typically don't come across in books like um, Rich Dad Poor Dad. You know, Rich Dad Poor Dad has like one. Uh, side and then another side and he shares that different example well in this book right he gives different stories on how to actually maneuver through different obstacles different things that you know or different perspectives that people have about money so if you are like just starting out in your financial freedom journey this is definitely a must like it just completely changes the the perspective that you have on money how to use it how to grow it how to multiply it how to maintain it how to get it um all of that so definitely definitely get it just get the book it's actually a really short book we're almost done with it we're like more than halfway through it already which is awesome um and definitely looking forward to finishing off this particular book get the summary points and sharing it with you guys so super super excited about that and by the way if you like Bob Proctor and you are interested in like going deeper within the paradigms within your mind within your body soul everything make sure to check out the playlist that Vanessa Black is reading it's incredible like the book that she's reading right now is change your mind change your paradigm it is off the chain you got to read it. You got to get that book. It's like it's such a small little book, but the the power within each chapter is magnificent. Promise you'll like it. So let's get into it. We're in chapter number 10. It's called Save Money. The only factor you can control generates one of the only things that matters. The only thing, the only factor you can control generates one of the only things that matter. How wonderful. Let's get into it. Let me convince you to save money. It won't take long, but it's an odd task, isn't it? Do people need to be convinced to save money? My observation is that yes, many do. Past a certain level of income, people fall into three groups. Those who save, those who don't think they can save, and those who don't think they need to save. This is for the latter two. The first idea, simple but easy to overlook, is that building wealth has little to do with your income or investment returns and lots to do with your savings rate. A quick story about the power of efficiency. In the 1970s, the world looked like it was running out of oil. The calculation wasn't hard. The global economy used a lot of oil the global, the global economy was growing and the amount of oil we could drill couldn't keep up. We didn't run out of oil, thank goodness, but that wasn't just because we found more oil or even better, or even got better at taking it out of the ground. The biggest reason we overcame the oil crisis is because we started building cars, factories, and homes that were more energy efficient than they used to be. The United States uses 60% less energy per dollar of GDP today than it did in the 1950s. Awesome. The average miles per gallon of all vehicles on the road doubled since 1975. A 1989 Ford Taurus, a sedan, averaged 18 miles per gallon. A 2019 Chevy Suburban, absurdly large SUV, averages 18.1 miles per gallon. The world grew its energy wealth, not by increasing the energy it had, but by decreasing the energy it needed. Mm. 
I know where he's going with this, and that's a really good way to put it. U.S. oil and gas production has increased 65% since 1975, while conservation and efficiency has more than doubled what we can do with that energy. So it's easy to see which has mattered more. The important thing here is that finding more energy is largely, largely out of our control, intruded in uncertainty because it relies on a slippery mix of having the right geology, geography, weather, and geopolitics. But becoming more efficient with the energy we use is largely in our control. The decision to buy a lighter car or ride a bike is up to you and has a 100% chance of improving efficiency. The same is true with our money. Investment returns can make you rich, but whether an investment strategy will work and how long it will work for, and whether markets will cooperate is always in doubt. Results are shrewded in uncertainty. Personal savings and frugality, finances, con conservation and efficiency are parts of the money equation that are more in your control and have a 100% chance of being as effective in the future as they are today. If you view building wealth as something that will require more money or big investment returns, you may become a pessimist as the energy doomers were in the 1970s. The path forward looks hard and out of your control. If you view it as powered by your own frugality and efficiency, the destiny is clear. Wealth is just the accumulated leftovers after you spent what you take in. And since you can build wealth, without a high income, but have no chance of building wealth without a high savings rate, it's clear which one matters more. That's a good way to put it. More importantly, the value of wealth is relative to what you need. So say you and I have the same net worth and say you're a better investor than me. I can earn 8% annual returns and you can earn 12% annual returns, but I'm more efficient with my money. Let's say I need half as much money to be happy while your lifestyle compounds as fast as your assets. I'm better off than you are. Despite being a worse investor, I'm getting more benefit from my investments to, despite lower returns. This same is true for incomes. Learning to be happy with less money creates a gap between what you have and what you want. Similar to the gap you get from growing your paycheck, but easier and more in, in your control. A high savings rate means having lower expenses than you otherwise could. And having lower expenses means your savings go farther than they would if you spent more. Think about this in the context of how much time and effort goes into achieving the 0.1% of annual investment outperformance. Millions of hours of research, tens of billions of dollars of effort from professionals. And it's easy to see what's potentially more important or worth chasing. There are professional investors who grind 80 hours a week to add a tenth of a percentage point to their returns. When, there's, when there are two or three full percentage points of lifestyle flow in their finances that can be exploited with, with less effort. Big investment returns and fat paychecks are amazing when they can be achieved and some can achieve them. But the fact that there's so much effort put into one side of the finance equation and so little put into the other in an opportunity for most people Past a certain level of income, what you need is just what sits below your ego. Everyone needs the basics. Once they've covered, there's another level of comfortable basics. And past that, there's basics that are both comfortable, entertaining, and enlightening. But spending beyond a pretty low level of materialism is mostly a reflection of ego approaching income a way to spend money to show people that you have or had money. Think of it like this. And one of the most powerful ways to increase your savings isn't to raise your income. It's to raise your humility. Ooh. Mm -hmm. 
I like that. When you define savings as the gap between your ego and your income, you realize why many people with decent incomes save so little. It's a daily struggle against instincts to extend your peacock feathers to the outermost limits and keep up with the others doing the same. People with enduring financial, personal finance success, not necessarily those with high incomes, tend to have a propensity to not give a damn what others think about them. So people's ability to save is more in their control than they may think. Savings can be created by spending less. You can spend less if you desire less, and you will desire less if you care less about what others think of you. Hmm. You will desire less if you care less about what others think of you. As I argue often in this book, money relies more on psychology than finance. And you don't need a specific reason to save. Some people save money for a down payment on a house or a new car or for retirement. That's great, of course, but saving doesn't not, does not require a goal of purchasing something specific. You can just save for saving's sake. And indeed, you should. Everyone should. Only saving for a specific goal makes sense in a predictable world, but ours isn't. Saving is a hedge against life's inevitable ability to surprise the hell out of you at the worst possible moment. Hmm. Another benefit of savings that isn't attached to a spending goal is what we discussed in chapter seven, gaining control over your time. Everyone knows the tangible stuff money buys. The tangible stuff is harder to wrap your head around, so it tends to go unnoticed. But the intangible benefits of money can be far more valuable and capable of increasing your happiness than the tangible things that are obvious targets of our savings. Savings without a spending goal gives you options and flexibility, the ability to wait and the opportunity to pounce. It gives you time to think and it lets you change course on your own terms. Every bit of savings is like taking a point in the future that would have been owned by someone else and giving it back to yourself. Let me repeat this line for you. Savings without a spending goal gives you options and flexibility, the ability to wait and the opportunity to pounce. It gives you time to think. It lets you change course on your own terms. This is this is probably one of the strongest lines I've read in this book here, because I think people overestimate the power of just waiting, like just don't do anything yet. Just wait, let it compound, let it, you know, grow into something and then you can use it. Like it gives you time to process. It gives you time to wait for the opportunity to pounce. The flexibility and control over your time is an unseen return on wealth. What is the return on cash in the bank that gives you the option of changing careers, retiring early, or freedom from worry? Priceless. And I'd say it's incalculable. It's incalculable in two ways. It's so large and important that we can't put a price on it but it's also literally incalculable. We can't measure it like we can measure interest rates. And what we can't measure, we tend to overlook. Hmm. What we can't measure, we tend to overlook. Dang, this guy's full of these really good one-liners today. When we don't have control over your time, when you don't have control over your time, you're forced to accept whatever bad luck is thrown your way. But if you have the flexibility, you have the time to wait for no-brainer opportunities that fall into your lap. And this is the hidden return on your savings. Savings in the bank that earns 0% might actually generate an extraordinary return if they give you the flexibility to take a job with a lower salary but more purpose or wait for investment opportunities that come 
when those without flexibility turn desperate. And that hidden return is becoming more important. The world used to be hyper-local. Just over 100 years ago, 75% of Americans had neither telephones nor regular mail service, according to historian Robert Gordon. That made competition for hyper-local. A worker with just the average intelligence might be the best in their town. And they got treated like the best because they didn't have to compete with the smarter worker in the other town. Things have changed. A hyper-connected world means the talent pool you compete in has gone from hundreds or thousands spanning your town to millions or billions spanning the globe. This is especially true for jobs that rely on working with your head versus your muscles. Teaching, marketing, analysis, consulting, accounting, programming, journalism, or even medicine increasingly compete in a global talent pool. More fields will fall into this category as digitization erases global boundaries, as software eats the world, as venture capitalists, Mark Anderson puts it. A question you should ask as the range of your competition expands is, how do I stand out? I'm smart it is increasingly a bad answer to that question because there are a lot of smart people in the world. Almost 600 people ace the SATs each year. Another 7,000 come with a handful of points. In a winner-take-all globalization world, these kinds of people are increasingly your direct competitors. Intelligence is not a reliable advantage in a world that becomes as connected as ours has, but flexibility is. In a world where intelligence is hyper-competitive and many previous technical skills have become automated, com competitive advantages tilt toward nuanced and soft skills like communication, empathy, and perhaps most of all, flexibility. Jesus. Literally this weekend, Vanessa and I spent the entire Saturday talking about this. How freaking amazing is this? Communication, empathy, and perhaps most of all, flexibility. Wow. In a world where intelligence and hyper-competitiveness and many previous technical skills have been automated. That's, that's what we're talking about the most. Competitive advantages tilt toward nuance and soft skills. If you have the flexibility, you can wait for good opportunities, both in your career and for your investments. You'll have a better chance of being able to learn a new skill when it's necessary. You'll feel less urgency to chase competitors who can do things you can't and have more leeway to find your passion and your niche at your own pace. You can find a new routine, a slower pace, and think about life with a different set of assumptions. Beautiful. The ability to do those things when most others can't is one of the few things that will set you apart in a world where intelligence is no longer a sustainable advantage. Having more control over your time and options is becoming one of the most valuable currencies in the world. That's why more people can and more people should save money. You know what else they should do? Stop trying to be so rational. And let me tell you why. And that's in the next chapter. Reasonable, rational. You know what? I got to tell you something about this book. The first chapter was a bit dark for me. The second chapter it was getting lighter. And then as we continue to read and read and read, we're in chapter 11 already. The chapters ge keep getting like lighter, but more colorful and deeper. And it makes more sense. I got to tell you, I think this is definitely one of my favorite chapters besides uh, chapter number seven, which was all about freedom. And I think it's because I really, I really believe in control. I really believe in having the ability to just give, I mean, this whole entire year, both Vanessa and I, we've given ourselves a whole year to 
do this. Like literally what I just read, find your passion in your niche at our own pace. Find a new routine, a slower pace. And think about life with a different set of assumptions. This literally just summarized my entire year. And I'm blessed to have had that. And I really, really believe that everyone deserves a, a year off. A year off the grind, a year off the hustle, a year off the, the intensity that comes with, you know, either building a business or, you know, being in the marketplace or like trying to like reach certain goals or whatever it is that you're looking to achieve. If you have a year where you can just literally think and process and really consume new information that allows you to delete all the limiting beliefs or the limiting things or the limiting factors or the limiting paradigms that have been placed upon you, that is where I feel success really blossoms and you're able to really breathe again. I wish that upon everyone and I hope everyone can receive that. Anyways, I hope you got a lot of value out of today's video. I know I did. And thank you so much for your time, for your flexibility and your ability to know thyself. I'll talk to you soon and have a blessed, blessed day ahead.